Hi, I'm Mike Hogue, and I'd like to welcome you to come to the First Church of Permaculture. There's an old sacred grove in the wildwood, no lovelier place in the vale. No place is so dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the vale. Oh, come, come, come. That grove in the wildwood, oh, come to that grove in the bay. No place is so dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the bay. How sweet on a bright Sunday morning to listen to that old Sabbath bell as its tones sweetly call us to wander. Oh, come to that grove in the bay. Oh, come, 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 come. Oh, come to that grove in the wild. Oh, come to that grove in the bay. No place is so dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the veil. And deep in the heart of that wild wood lies one my love so well. She sleeps, sweetly sleeps beneath the willow. Disturb not a rest in the veil. And next to her side in the wildwood, neath the trees where the wild flowers bloom, when the farewell hymn shall be chanted, a rest by her side. In the tomb, oh, come, 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 oh, come to that grove in the valley, oh, come to that grove in the So dear to my childhood as that old sacred grove in the veil. Oh, come, 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 come. Thank you for offer. coming to the first church of permaculture here, our little sacred grove in the wild wood. And uh, I always love that song because it does a little trick. Taking us from a happy, upbeat place. We we're listening to the planes and the bicyclists going by. And uh, it takes us down into this really uh, focused and uh, calm kind of place when it works well. And uh, it's a reminder to me in uh, this last week or so when uh, 
things have been very, uh, very wild out there in the world. And there's a lot of uh, things happening that uh, are demanding our attention and uh, calling us to action in the world, to take action, to transform the world we have. That we also need to be finding ways to tune in and take care of ourselves and give ourselves that space of self-care and uh, give ourselves, find ways to tune into the present moment, take care of, uh, take care of our own minds and our mental spaces because otherwise it's difficult for us to take that transformative action. So we need both. We need to both allow ourselves at a time like this to get angry, to let it motivate us towards action. And we also need to be able to make space for ourselves like this today to uh, come together and calm down and find ways to, to help ourselves relax. I'm also reminded that... Uh, that uh, right now, the most healthful space is to be in. And the ones that I think uh, I recognize really care for me are the ones that, are, that come to me in that, that uh, full space. They're not just trying to make me angry to use my anger. You know, they're also allowing me the space for self-care because we need to do both if we're going to be affected and, and transforming the world. So with that note, and with this idea that um, we're coming together here with each other in that mind space of cultivating, um, cultivating that, that uh, healthy and whole way of being together. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to check in with or bring into this discussion this week. Just looking around. We'll definitely find some place later on to have some uh, some uh, planned discussions. Oh no, okay, well I'm, I'm glad you made it, Jeffrey. Um, hopefully other people can find it. Um, if anyone wants to, you can feel free to grab the link and uh, post it over there in the Transformative Adventures group if you're not seeing it. Um, I'm just going to grab that link and put it in the chat so that anyone who needs to can find it. I tried to post it a couple times in the, the uh, Permaculture in Action group so people could find it if they could. So today, you know, it's, it's a good reminder in this week when we're, I think a lot of us are experiencing uh, feelings of conflict, that uh, we're going to be talking about weeds. Because a lot of us come to gardening with the idea that we love nature, and we want to connect to nature, and we want to connect to our food, and then... We learn uh, systems and ways of gardening that are all about fighting nature. And instead, it places us in a mindset of being in constant conflict with nature. We're out there weeding, finding all of the plants that are uh, against our goals that we're in conflict with. We call them weeds and all the animals that we're in conflict with, and we call them pests. And we really need to find some better ways where we can really meet our needs and goals for the landscape that don't place us so much in that feeling of conflict with nature and instead place us more in some feeling of cooperation with nature. So that's one of the big things we're going to be talking about later today is, is that. Um, you know, and today we're going to be talking about some systems thinking. Because a lot of those ways that we come into conflict with nature are about brute force, are about us 
you know, trying to fight with our uh, with brute force against the weeds and the pests and trying to overcome them and their numbers. And that's the way we tend to think about a lot of problems in our society. When we tend to be more effective when we move up to more uh, to, to to bigger things of figuring out how to deal with systems and behaviors and more powerful tools than that. So we're going to, yes, so we're evolve the whole. So we're going to uh, talk about those powerful systems leverage points today, uh, especially in the context of weeds. And, uh, you know, good, that's a good segue to our first segment here. Um, you know, one of my good friends, Josh, uh, always used to say that, uh, that there's not enough culture in permaculture, which is one of the things that we're always trying to talk about here in this group, because culture is one of those leverage points, right? A lot of the things that shape society and give us the world that we have today are all about these subtle cultural tools. So, a lot of times we discount things like art and music and culture creation. But if we were smart, we'd recognize that some, those are some of the most powerful tools we have. So today I'm, I'm happy that we're going to be uh, checking in with, uh, with artist Rebecca Stockert and, uh, and talking to her about some of her art and culture creation. And, uh, and of course, she's also quite an activist. So, uh, so maybe we'll find out how uh, art uh, engages with activism and culture creation for her and, uh, and take a look at some of her art and, and see some of the things that she has going on. Oh, hi, Rebecca. Hi, Mike. Thank you for having me on today and letting me talk about my artwork. Um, I did create a slideshow, so I'm going to share that. Fantastic. So Mike invited me on today um, to talk about my work. He and I worked on a few things together, and I thought that I would kind of start about 10 years ago now, and then go through the work that I'm doing. A lot of my work has to do with nature, especially in the Midwest. And um, it has kind of a, I want to say, maybe a magical realism um, flair, also spiritual. I like to connect imagery with nature and spirituality. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that really, uh, uh, you know, um, I really appreciated about your work when I discovered it was uh, just these these depictions of, of nature you have and, you know, what you were just saying about the connection between nature and spirituality is so, uh, so important. I'm sure a lot of us here in, uh, in this permaculture church group recognize that a lot of the problems that we have in society aren't really so much, you know, just like problems with the economy or problems with farming. They're really spiritual problems. I, I just love how, uh, how you bring that spiritual connection to nature of your work. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so here are a couple pieces. This one from 2011 is an oil painting. And that was a piece that I did during my graduate, during graduate school. And then on the right, um, 2016, so that's when I just started doing watercolor. Um, so I started really with oil painting and then moved to watercolor. Both of these have kind of an iconic uh, uh, message, which can be seen as spiritual. Um, I myself am not religious, but I do like iconography and the power of the religious image. Um, you can see there's a mandala and then there's nature themes there as well. Um, and yeah, and, uh, can I, can I just add to that too? Yeah. Just the idea that, you know, uh, to me, and, and I hope what we're trying to do here with the first church of permaculture is, uh, touch on some things that may be, uh, satisfying, um, to us on a spiritual level, but it's open to people who, uh, you know, without 
having the, a, a, a direct sort of like spiritual or religious sort of idea. You know, we can all uh, pursue self-actualization in this world uh, without having, you know, believing in, in, uh, in religions. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can do whatever you want with the dogma, you know, you all have to follow it like everybody else. Um, in 2017 or 18, I started working with the works of Gene Stratton Porter. And if you are in the Midwest, maybe, or in Indiana, um, you may have heard of her. She died in 1924. Um, she is considered the J.K. Rowling of her time. Um, she wrote The Girl of the Limberlost, Freckles, and she was a poet. She was a conservationist. Um, she was one of the first women to have uh, a movie production studio in Hollywood. Um, she was an architect. She was an amazing woman. And two of her homes are now historic sites in Indiana. One, they're both in Northeast Indiana, but uh, Rome City is close to Michigan. Um, so I started interpreting some of her works uh, into imagery because she was mostly a writer and she did photography. So this is, I guess, 2017. Here's a watercolor uh, that I did that was made in her gardens um, in Rome City. So we've got a skunk here with a, a garden. And then here's a couple more pieces that I've done. Um, just some plein air painting. Again, these are in watercolor. Um, you know, all of the works kind of have an iconic uh, feel to them. And then here's a couple more. These are in 2018 as well. One of Jean Stratton Porter was Moths. She wrote a book called Moths of the Limberlost. Um, here in Northeast Indiana, it used to be the Black Swamp. So during the Civil War, when she was born, most of Ohio and Indiana was a swamp. And part of her work was documenting and writing about um, nature around her. And throughout her life, much of the swamp was drained, um, the trees were all cut down, and now we have what you see here in Indiana. Um, and she moved, ended up moving to uh, Southern California later on in her life. Oh, and, you know, Becky, I want to say, uh, yep. Dennis mentions that he uh, he likes the skunk. And, you know, skunks don't get oh. enough love, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, no, you very know, cute. Yeah. Uh, and one thing that I think Mike wants me to talk about is entrepreneurship. Oh, before you do that, could we yeah. actually talk just a little bit more about Gene Stratton Porter there? Uh, sure. You know, because... Uh, for anyone else who doesn't know about her, from what I've learned from you and and uh, uh, Becky and I actually went there and did a little tour or two at one of uh, one of her homes. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, maybe she could tell you. The one in Rome City, probably. Yeah, and um, and uh, and you know she's really kind of one of our first you know proto permaculturists, and uh, and a lot of the work that she was doing observing nature apparently. You know, ended up having some scientific credibility as well. A lot of people, a lot of scientists were following her work because of uh, because of that. And uh, and she actually has an amazing garden there that's been kind of you know readapted a bit and reimagined a bit, but also preserved. And uh, she liked to call her garden her tame garden because at her time, a lot of people who've read my book know that there was a big movement in garden gardening around her time called wild garden. And this was one of the first movements to create landscapes that worked with nature and that were really sustainable. And she took that same idea and did her own thing with it. And she created this garden there that integrates in some of her favorite uh, garden plants with a bunch of native plants and the, the native landscape there. And it's all kind of in that wild garden style, but with a little bit more uh, management to it. And it's really kind of an interesting model for, for a lot of what we're doing in permaculture. So I, I love that you have this connection to, 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 uh, to a woman I'd like to consider one of our, our, our uh, proto-permaculturists. Even if, even if she's not recognized for it. 
Yeah, I mean, she um, worked with a lot of the national conservation organizations during her time, which I know that conservation isn't the same as permaculture. Um, and that it's not perfect. Conservation is not perfect. Um, but yeah, she loved to gather plants from all over Northeast Indiana and take them to her garden in Rome City. So thank you for sharing that, Mike. Um, and she uh, was an entrepreneur. Um, she uh, did lots of different things. You know, this was a, she lived in a time before women could vote, and she became a multi-millionaire. And she built her own houses. Um, she sold hundreds of thousands, millions of books, and um, uh, her books are still selling and in print. Um, but she, so she had a lot of different things that she did. And, you know, I think permaculturists, and especially some of the things that Mike talk about, talks about, um, has to do with entrepreneurship. And that's kind of how I lived my life as well. You know, I'm an artist and I have these paintings. Um, but it's like you always have a lot of different things going on, a lot of different streams of income. So, you know, I make paintings and then I also have another business uh, called Cat People Press where I paint a lot of cats <laughs> and sell like t-shirts and cards and things like that. Um, and then I also have some rental properties. Um, I do some grant writing. So like, you know, permaculturists, there's, uh, there's a lot of different things coming together to make a life. Um, here's a couple more of my pieces. These are more recent. The one on the left with the mirror, that one I did during the pandemic, that was a pandemic painting and I spent way too long on it. Um, so that would have been 2020 when I painted that one. And then the one here on the right, um, I finished this year. And these are both acrylic. So I moved from oil painting to watercolor painting to acrylic now. And actually this one on the right um, is painted on an old door. So one of the houses that I bought uh, it was built in 1880, but it had been used as an apartment, uh, as a duplex for years and years and years. So unfortunately it doesn't have a lot of the old charm that a house that's 140 some years old might have. And it had a lot of those um, wooden hollow doors that are super cheap. Now you can like poke a hole through them like a piece of white bread. And so I took those out and I'm like, what am I going to do with these, um, these doors? So I ended up cutting them up and using them to paint upon. So the piece on the right here, uh, the poppy is painted on an old door. So there's lots of different ways to bring permaculture into your life. Um, and then these are two of my most recent pieces. The one on the left, this is another poppy. Um, that one's about three foot by three foot. And I just finished that on Friday. Um, and it's for a project here in Indiana that I'm working on. And then the one on the right, you guys might recognize uh, some of Michael's imagery in there, the Luna Moth and the Moon Cycle. And that's a piece that um, I'm working on for Michael that he's going to be using for his sign project. So Michael, I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I absolutely love what you, what you did with the art there. And, and by the way, anybody uh, recognize some of the plants that we see here? We have some uh, wonderful perennial edible plants featured in this, including the top left. It's a beautiful depiction of pawpaw flowers. Yep, we got sunchokes on the right there, and uh, all sorts of all sorts of good stuff. So, I um oh yeah, absolutely. We got ostrich ferns in there for the fiddleheads, also uh, a native plant, and this really represents the kind of landscapes that we're trying to create in permaculture, right? There are landscapes that aren't just about, uh, uh, say, having native plants or having habitat. 
and those things are amazing and great too, as Becky was saying earlier, conservation is great and part of permaculture, but a lot of us in permaculture are really trying to create landscapes that go beyond that and also reintegrate people into the landscapes so that, uh, so that they're meeting our needs too. Because a lot of the problems in the world today are caused by the way we're trying to meet our needs, right? Our destructive food system and, and, and uh, our destructive clothing systems and, and all of these things. So permaculture calls us to go a step further and to take responsibility for how we're meeting our needs and integrate into the landscapes to do that. So this painting Becky has here shows a care a landscape that uh, integrates habitat for birds and wildlife and insects. And uh, it takes care of water and we see the fungi there and nurse logs. So it's taking care of the soil um, and it has space for us in it too. So this is going to be uh, adapted to be one of the signs for the landscape transformation recognition program that we've been working on now for years. We're finally getting really close to the end. Uh, we've got, uh, we have hundreds of people now, uh, uh, leaders across the, uh, the movement who have looked at our criteria for the landscape transformation program, uh, signed on to endorse that. And now we, we have a, uh, 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 the artwork that is going to become the signs. So hopefully within the next couple of months, uh, if you want to, uh, to show and communicate to your neighbors the values that you have for your landscape, you'll be able to uh, uh, get a sign with this, with Becky's amazing art here on it, um, that also will communicate the goals that you have for your landscape. And I'll have a QR so people can click on it and go and take a look at more information about what they can get uh, about what you're doing in your landscape. And it's going to come with a bunch of materials like form letters uh, that you can write to your local uh, city commission and to your local, uh, your local newspaper so that you can communicate what you're trying to do. As really, that's the next step, right? One thing, having sign like this and communicating with our neighbors can help us not get fines <laughs> from the city. And also, it's going to help us communicate our values in a new way. And the other thing about this is there's already signs out there uh, for things uh, like the uh, uh, Landscape Architects of America, but they're focusing on some different things. And in a way, because they don't go as far as we're going, they can kind of become like greenwashing. So we've created uh, within the Transformative Adventures Group a set of criteria that really transform landscapes and are truly sustainable. So I'm I'm just blown away by this art. I think a lot of people are going to want to have uh, your your art, Becky, at the uh, at the front of their garden, where people can see this and and uh, and have it communicate their values and their goals for the landscapes. So, with that said, and uh, so that's that's going to be one of the exciting programs we have coming up. And that's also a good time to mention, you know, the the next modular transformative adventures permaculture design certificate course cycle we're going to be focusing on entrepreneurship and uh and making right livelihoods like becky mentioned and i think she's got a great example of the kinds of things that we'll be focusing on um, and we're going to be arming our activists with great tools to really help organize in their own communities like this landscape transformation program, uh, recognition program, so that you all will become the leaders helping people meet those criteria and, uh, and, uh, and, and get that sign and get recognition for it. So hopefully we're going to be able to make this kind of landscape transformation really popular in our landscapes and, and help you all create great livelihoods as leaders in your community by doing it. So this is just one of the next tools that we have for making that happen. So I'm so glad that Becky could join us and, and, uh, and chat about, about all this. Um, does anyone have questions for her about her, her artwork or about her career or about the way she's uh, approached entrepreneurship?
just checking through. All right. Well, if you do, um, you can actually I do. I have a question. Sure. I want to know if you do charcoal, if you do pencil drawings, black and white, dark stuff like that. I, you seem like the kind of person who does just about anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> too many things. That's the thing, you know. Sometimes you get too many things going on. Um, I don't do charcoal. It's really messy, so I don't like it. Um, I've never really gotten into it when I was, I was forced to do it in undergrad, but then after that, I stopped. Um, then I do pencil drawings. I mean, I do screen printing. Um, and that, like by hand, I do the screens myself and then hand print them. So with that, it has to be just black line art. And I do some drawing. Um, watercolor is a lot like drawing. So, um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thanks, thanks. I want to talk to you later. I'll send you a chat or something. Okay. I've got a, a, a book I'm finishing and I, I mm -hmm. respect what you're doing there and uh, we may just be a fit. I don't okay. know, we'll, we'll talk about it. Cool. Oh, awesome. And Aaron says, uh, I love what you said about a lot of things coming together to make a life with respect to both permaculture and diverse income streams. Uh, where can we follow your artwork? I will put um, a link to my website in the chat. It's just RebeccaStockert.com. Oh, that's not a link. Well, you can copy and paste that. And that has um, links to my Instagram, which I post on, my Facebook. And it's got my portfolio too. Let me see if I can get a link so you can just click it. There we go. See if this works. There, there's a link. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ruth, I think Ruth has her hand up. Oh, uh, Ruth, please. I didn't see you. That's fine. Hi, Becky. I love your artwork. It's just absolutely smashingly beautiful. Thank you. Um, and I have a question. You said you have some rental properties. Mm -hmm. um, how did you start out in that? Did you just go cold turkey into that? Did you have something gifted to you? What was like the financial yeah. investment? What'd you do? I'm curious. Yeah, it was a lot of things that came together. Um, I bought a house in 2015 on my own. It was my house. I still own it. And um, then I got married and <laughs> moved in with my now ex-husband. And when we were um, together, we bought a duplex. Um, and so when I was married, I moved into my ex-husband's house and I rented my house that I had bought when I was single because I didn't want to sell it. And I'm like, oh, maybe this would be a good way to make some extra income. And it ended up being really good. Um, I know some people have problem with problems with tenants and people destroying their houses or whatever, but that's not ever been a problem for me, knock on wood. Uh, yeah, you know, here in my, where I live in Fort Wayne, I'm really connected to the art community. So all, and I, um, all of my tenants have been word of mouth. Um, I've never done a background check on anyone. I've never done, uh, uh, a credit check on anyone and it's always been really good um so my first house I bought got married rented that out when I was married um he and I bought a duplex together and the plan was that I would use half of it for my studio and then the other half we would rent for income and you know things don't always work out <laughs> and uh so that relationship ended and I got the duplex in, um, uh, in the divorce. And I lived in half of it for two years and used the other half as my studio. And then I did have some inheritance. So um, I, you know, a couple of years ago, it was, 
it was really tough. I had um, like two grandparents and my mother died and it was real. it was very difficult. Um, Sorry. Thank you. Uh, but from that, I got inheritance money. And so I used that to invest in the properties. And then I bought another house. <laughs> so now I've got three. And um, I'm now renting half of the duplex and using half as a um, as my studio. And then living in another house that is a constant work in progress because it was a foreclosure and has been just a it's been a wild ride with that. So um, it has been luck. Um, you know, my first house I did buy on my own. I was able to buy the third house because of inheritance. You know, you kind of, you know, I got lucky, but you also, I guess lucky. I mean, it depends how you, <laughs> in terms of money with the inheritance um, and the divorce. I mean, it's just, Things happen all the time and it, it just depends on what you do with it and how you decide right. to invest. And when I think about money and spending money, I always think about it as an investment. How can, you know, if I put, when I spend this money, how is that going to come back to me? So I could have gone to Europe, you know, for a month or something, <laughs> which would have been great. But sure. instead I invested that in real estate and um, yeah, I looked at the stock market, but I just morally cannot invest in the, you know, bring myself to invest in the stock market, even with ESGs. Now I looked into those and it's just not something that I, not a place I want to put my money. So I invest in real estate. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things that we talk about a, a lot in like the transformative ventures, PDC and, um, and our programs on finding right livelihood is, uh, is you know, frankly, uh, over the last hundred years or so, a lot of the, the wealth that's been made in America by, by regular families has been in, in real estate, especially in their own homes. And, uh, you know, we can also say that, look around and see like Warren Buffett buying, it, buying up properties in urban places left and right and that driving up rents and we can see problems with that too but i really strongly believe that 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 means that you and i people like us here on this call have an obligation in a way to get you know if we can i'm not saying anybody has to but there's a real need for people like us to get involved in fixing that you know the measure of how bad an industry like the housing industry is is also as Bill Molson said, the, the problem is the, uh, is the solution. You know, the problem is the opportunity. It's the opportunity principle. We need to own our cities, you know, where we live. We need to own our communities, not Warren Buffett. <laughs> yeah, so it's a real need for us to, to, to do that kind of thing. So I, I like that. You know, I agree with Becky. I don't want to put my money into the corporations that I know are destroying the planet. I would rather do it into something that I know is regenerative. So I really respect the way she's done that. Hey, uh, you, would you mind telling us just a little bit? And I, I guess I, I want to say one more thing, I guess, which is that I love that you acknowledge luck. Uh, because if you look at anybody, any of the people in the permaculture world or the art world or the activism world, or even the business world, who are, we hold up as being successful, they've all been lucky, you know? Whether or not they believe that or not, you know, we've all been, right, we've all been, it's all been things coming together, forces bigger than ourselves, our communities, our, our parents, our ancestors, any of that. So it's just so, it's really important for us to be able to acknowledge those things too. And that makes it us more open to trying to make sure other people in our communities have access to that same kind of luck. Instead of just thinking, I made it all myself and anybody who can't do that just needs to pick themselves up with their bootstraps, right? So acknowledging that's important. Now, would you mind yeah. telling us a little bit about, about uh, uh, you mentioned a, sh a sheriff sale, getting a foreclosure. I just want people to know that you don't necessarily have to go through a big mortgage company and pay a hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, you know, in or going to one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt 
to necessarily get a house. And you've accessed, I want people to see your model that you've accessed some real estate um, that's, uh, that's more affordable. And I think you used a one, you, one, you found a community program that helped you, helped you with it. And then of course you also uh, purchased a property in a sheriff sale. Um, you, do you want to talk about those things? Yeah, too? I can talk about it. Um, and also really I want to affirm something that you said that people don't like make it. I mean, some people make it on their own. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it is about community and like, you know, it helps if you come from a family, my family didn't have any money, but you know, when you sell off the family farm, then people have money <laughs> all of a sudden. So, um, but usually people have a support system or they come from money. I mean, things don't just come out of nowhere. And I did spend a long time um, living very frugally with my son as a single parent uh, and it's not easy and it really does help when you've got that extra boost. But yeah, my first house um, I did buy, I got a grant through um, HUD for, I think it was $10,000 as a down payment. Um, and I did that through an organization here in Northeast Indiana. So I had, uh, I think I was within some kind of income uh, bracket and I had my son so um, I, I went through a home buying uh, program. And then on the back end of that, HUD um, uh, helped you with your down payment. So I think they have these across the country um, and it, it really helped. I mean, it, it brought my monthly payment down and then also I didn't have to pay as much for the house. So it's really nice. And uh, here in Fort Wayne, I mean, it's not, it's changing every day. Real estate used to be so cheap um, and it's going up across the board. Um, but with the sheriff sale, I don't know if today's the right day to ask me if I thought that was a good idea <laughs> or not. Um, I did, you do have to have cash. Uh, you buy it sight unseen. I mean, you can drive by, but you can't go in it. And, um, you know, I bought that house in July of last year, got access at the end of August, and we've been working on it since then and moved in in March. So we've been living there a few months. It's a lot of work, um, a lot of frustrations. Of course, it's very rewarding when you, you know, fix things that are wacko. Um, but it, I mean, it's not for the faint of heart. And if you don't have those skills, if you don't have you know, those skills, I don't know if I would recommend it. Um, but if you are handy and you're not afraid of some sweat equity, um, yeah, it's a good way to get a house. You know, when I when we went to the sheriff's sale, it's interesting. Um, most of the people that were buying these houses were white dudes, you know. <laughs> They were these guys that were just coming in and buying them all up. They were going to flip them. A lot of these, and it's, our tax sale is the same. I like going to the tax sale. And it's like you've got half a dozen guys in a room of like 100 people, and they're, they're buying up all the properties for like millions of dollars. So just like a handful of people you know, have, or have, all the, have the money, and they're buying up all of those properties. And a lot of them are not from the area. A lot of them are coming from out of state and buying the real estate, uh, which makes me, I'm very unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if, if you have cash and you are willing to put in the time and energy, um, but you, I mean, you can get, you can buy houses on the market uh, that are not sheriff sale with a traditional mortgage and if you're willing to tear up carpet and paint and do a little carpentry work, uh, pulling in a toilet is not very hard. Everybody here can do it. <laughs> Anybody here can, yeah. Anybody here can do floors. I mean, painting floors, it's, it's possible that you can do it. So. Yeah.
Electrical and plumbing, I don't mess with. I mean, toy leg. Plumbing inside the walls, electrical, roofs, I don't mess with that stuff. But other things, it's, it's doable. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and talking about that. I'm so glad that we talked about those other elements too. That's just absolutely essential for the work that we're doing as permaculturists. And a lot of us tend to focus more on, on the gardens, you know, that's kind of like the, that's the carrot of permaculture, right? As we enter for the gardens, but it's really important to remember that we're trying to regenerate society in other ways. And uh, it's uh, one of the first things that permaculturist Peter Bain, who wrote the Permaculture Handbook, when, when I met him and he came to visit my last uh, house project, um, he talked about, you know, that uh, uh, us buying houses in, uh, in, in disrepair and buying land and regenerating them. And he said, you know, that's pretty much what we do as permaculturists. You know, that's what we're doing. We're retrofitting the suburbs. We're retrofitting um, houses. We're doing this. This is the holistic work of permaculture, not, not just having cool gardens. So I, I like the example that you, you brought us here today of doing all of that and all those models uh, for, for the kind of livelihoods that most of us who will be successful doing permaculture are probably going to have livelihoods that, that look more like what Becky described. A lot of things coming together to make it work and including thinking of transformative investments, thinking of regenerative investments, uh, thinking of, this is using systems thinking to change our relationship with money. Now we're gonna talk about systems thinking to change our relationship with weeds today. And keep in mind as we do that, we can apply the same types of thinking to money and, uh, and Rebecca's a good model for that. So if anyone else has any, uh, any questions for Becky, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Hopefully uh, she'll, she'll be able to answer those that way. All right, well, it's about 1.50 here. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? If you feel like it, you can say hi to each other, have a bit of chat um, and uh, uh, in the chat or use the space here. And we'll come back and we'll chat about zones and permaculture's most powerful tools. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Becky. All right, take a break, we'll be back in 10. Hello, we're back. All right. Oh, someone has something to say? Please do. I just said hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, by the way, were, were you able to, did, were, was music coming through? Yes, it was. Okay, I'm not always sure if that's working or not. So I know you can't that. tell from your end. Yeah. So I, I guess uh, I thought I thought Lizzo could join us for church this morning. She's kind of yeah, an unofficial permaculture musician. <laughs> I kind of feel like um, I kind of feel like uh, like uh, permaculture in general. We talk about the culture of permaculture. We have too many, you know, guys with acoustic guitars and uh <laughs> so i you know i want lizzo to join us for permaculture here all right i am going to drop a link here in the chat okay that's going to be the presentation we're going to oh i only shared it with aaron here let me fix that okay and now everybody's got it. Okay, so that's the link we're gonna be looking at. And uh, well, let's take a look at that. I'm gonna talk about permaculture's most powerful tools. You know, I sent out an email this morning saying, oh, let's see, did that not work? Okay, let me try that one more time. Okay, there we go saying that a lot of times people kind of want permaculture to be more about 
the stuff that we do. And that's important too. You know, I definitely think that we have to learn, relearn some lost skills. We have to figure out skills for gardening well, especially gardening without plastics, poisons, and petroleum. Um, but a lot of times, permaculture isn't necessarily the stuff we do. It's how we interact with big systems so that maybe we don't even have to do stuff. <laughs> In other words, a lot of the, the approaches we're taught to weeding, for example, are about getting out there and pulling out all the weeds with our hands. But here's the thing. If you get out there and use that brute force method of pulling out the weeds with your hands, you have worked weeding work into the garden forever. Forever, every year, you'll be coming back and pulling out more weeds. If you can figure out how to solve that garden problem instead with your mind, then you've done your weeding work like a Jedi. And then you'll never have to use your hands to weed that area again, or at least not very much. And I can tell you that approach really does work. And um, it usually does take, um, it, it can take a couple of years to get there, right? The plants that we're establishing have to have to be uh, taken care of and protected to weed from weeds sometimes until they're established. But once we're there, these kinds of gardens can really radically be no weeding over a long period of time. Yeah, Obi Weed Kenobi, I like it. <laughs> yeah, see, you want to be Obi Weed Kenobi solving the problems with your mind instead of being Darth Weeder and solving them with a lightsaber. It's just not effective. The lightsaber is not a very good tool for weeding. All right. So uh, this is a slideshow that we'll be looking at Tuesday and Thursday night at six o'clock uh, Eastern time. We're gonna be going into a lot more depth in permaculture's most powerful tools. But the most powerful one we're gonna kind of cover today. So uh, we're gonna, try to get some of this out there. We're gonna go more depth as we go, but this is uh, the, the slideshow for those who join. So one thing that we can talk about right away before we get started is uh, a process for design. Now, Bill Mollison gave us a very long, elaborated, formal process, design process for doing the work of permaculture. And uh, a lot of people don't, uh, in fact, some people have said he, he never did that. But it's actually there in the designer's manual. He gave us a, a, a complete process, formal process for design and recommended we follow it. Um, but for a lot of us, that design process might be a bit much to do all the time. So over the course of the years of transformative adventures, we were finally made a shortened design process, which we call plenty. Uh, as in, once you've done it, you've done plenty of design. Now you can go ahead and actually do the work. I just want to pull, we're going to go into this in more depth on Tuesday night, but I want to say it starts with polishing the mirror. And this means getting the conditions right where we can see clearly and make good decisions. This means going back to the thing that we started this class with, figuring out ways to work on ourselves and our minds and the conditions that we need in order to do that design work. Um, this might be something that Bill Molson didn't emphasize enough, but when a lot of my students start doing their permaculture projects and the permaculture sites, one of the biggest problems they have or barriers they have is that life gets in the way. All of these things, uh, family and relationships and uh, uh, maybe financial hardships, all of these things get in the way of our overall permaculture goals. So that's what we mean when we say polishing the mirror is the very first step in our design process for good permaculture design is to check in with ourselves and make sure that we're ready for the project. We're ready 
to take on that design project. We don't have a, a, other things to do. So that's a great place for us to start is with that idea of polishing the mirror. Um, so this is the transformative adventures roadmap for having a beautiful and abundant life. We're gonna talk about this in more detail in Permaculture Church on Sundays and go into it in more detail. And this is just a tool uh, to, uh, to help us envision a complete design for our lives. And I just wanna point out today that uh, the bottom layer, yeah, the very bottom layer here. Oh, the bird, sorry, is it, is it so loud that I need to go inside? No, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's kind of lovely. Um, so uh, it's it's adds the ambience we're looking for for uh, for our sacred grove in the wildwood. So this is a picture of your mind. Or rather, it's a picture of what most people kind of see when they close their eyes. So that makes it a pretty good picture of mine. Now, if you close your eyes right now, you'll probably see something that uh, represents some, depending on the light level you're in, it might be a color similar to this. What you're really looking at is of course, uh, you know, the color of blood vessels and and things like that, and, and darkness, and a mix of, you know, the inside of your eyeballs, actually, and the blood vessels there. But what's really interesting about that, oh, that's the cat, Jerry, knocking down my camera. Um, what's really interesting about that is that your brain will try to turn it into patterns. So a lot of people, when they're closed their eyes and sit for a moment, they'll start to see geometric patterns, often circles or squares or triangles. These are some of the most basic sorts of patterns that we can recognize. And our brain starts looking for those kinds of patterns. It's really important to notice that because whatever we're doing, whatever we build the rest of our designs on, our brains are going to be looking for patterns in those too. And if we come to the whole process uh, from a situation that is uh, stressed out and we're maybe angry or upset, we'll impose angry, upset patterns on everything that we see. So being, a, so again, having some way to help ourselves calm down practice being calm, practice being happy as much as we can in this crazy world and practice um, being open-minded to things. This, this can help with all the rest of our designs. Everything else that we design, and here's, here's Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Everything else that we design is going to be based and built on that grounding of our mind. Everything else that we experience in this life will be based on that. So that's where our designs start. So the next thing that you see in this is the globe, the beautiful earth that we all inhabit together, this blue gold globe. And then we can see some other things that we can think about building into our permaculture designs. We're going to talk about that uh, as we go on in this class and get in, uh, a good in-depth understanding of how we can help ourselves build a more beautiful and abundant life and help everyone else in our communities do the same so that we're building a beautiful and abundant world. I'm just going to give a little space to that in case any of those ideas resonate with people or anyone has anything else uh, to share about those topics today. Okay, we're, we're going to skip some of this other stuff that we're going to come back to uh, Tuesday night in our program. Well, that'll be Tuesday night at, uh, at 6 Eastern time. 
Uh, we moved from Monday, Wednesday, just to note for everyone who has joined these sessions over a long period of time, we moved from Monday, Wednesday for a change, just to change things up and try to get more people involved, people who, who couldn't join on Monday, Wednesday. So we're going to try some Tuesday, Thursdays to see if we can catch some people. So um, when we talk about methods and concepts and design, we have a few tools that are more powerful than anything else. And there's one in particular that we're going to talk about because it's really one of my favorites. But this whole idea brings us back to this, this concept that what we're talking about is interacting with more powerful forces than just the brute force of our own labor to solve problems. Now, Danella Meadows, uh, who wrote, uh, who was part of the Club of Rome and wrote uh, The Limits to Growth Report um, and uh, uh, the book Systems Thinking, or Thinking in Systems. These are uh, just fundamental books for permaculturists. There's also an update on systems thinking for, for uh, social change, for societal change, because these same things apply. These are great books. And uh, Bill Mollison, was very inspired by Danella Meadows, he said. And uh, Meadows gave us these system, these leverage points for changing systems. What she said is that oftentimes we start, you know, it, with, with, with brute force, we start down at the bottom. If you look at this and think of this as a leverage bar, what you see is on the left side, we have low leverage. It's really easy to figure out how to reach that though. It's low to the ground, right? And so we can grab a hold of that. We know what we have to do. All we have to do is grab that bar and pull it. And we, we, can, we can change things. So this usually means we track numbers and resources. So if we're talking about fertility in the garden, it's about getting a soil test. If we're talking about changing poverty, we might be talking about just tracking people's incomes and trying to directly uh, give people tax dollars or something like that, or tax breaks. Um, if we're talking about watering, we might just talk about how much water the garden needs and grab that can of water and go out and water it. It's all of these things usually involve brute force, mechanically changing numbers. Danella Meadows said, because this is easy to understand, it's where we always go to. Now, if I can, if you don't mind me saying so, we can think of uh, recent, recent politics as well uh, and things going on this week because these brute force methods always also avoid or, uh, involve conflict. So if we're talking about weeding, we're talking, we're talking about going out and literally uh, being in conflict with the weeds that want to grow, right? That mint wants to grow in the garden and we're in a conflict with it because we want to grow tomatoes instead of mint. So we have a conflict there. So we always tend to focus in on this conflict perspective. Uh, for example, we might look at a uh, number of uh, abortions and some people may genuinely want to change that number. And so the thing that they go to is, is specifically using the brute force method of controlling women's bodies, right? So maybe some people, uh, I think some people are taking advantage of that and using that inherent political conflict because they know that it's going to cause conflict. They know that it's going to cause conflict and that it's going to bring it up. Yes, yeah, Sandy, I'm, I, I feel like I need to talk about it because it's such an important thing for 50% of the global human human population, you know? And if we're not talking about this, it might not be a permaculture group. It might be just a men's permaculture group. So we need to talk about these things at least a little bit. I'm not, what I'm going to say is I'm not going to avoid talking about it. So if we can move that kind of thinking into more effective areas, we're talking about behavior change, system change, deep change. You know, maybe making alleviating some of the pressures on young women that young women face, so that they feel like their lives are ending if they if they do have children, because it, our society gives people no ways to meet their needs. Maybe that would be a more effective way to uh, to solve that problem. Just as one example, um, 
but we don't think there. We focus in on brute force. So this is always where we kind of go to. So an example for farmers is that, uh, uh, is for example, with fertility in the garden. The first thing we could do is test the numbers and directly make the changes. So you get a soil test and then you buy your synthetic fertilizer uh, and then you monitor for pests and stuff and you spray and it's a whole system. And it's all about conflict with natural systems and then directly changing those numbers. You got too many pests, you measure them and then you spray them with something from the, from, uh, you know, Monsanto. As we move up from there, we can change the behaviors that are actually causing the decline in soil fertility. So we stop tilling, we stop uh, uh, pest life cycles uh, before they've begun. We stop growing things in monocultures, which we know destroys soil fertility. So we change our behaviors next. As we move up from that, we can change our whole systems and change the goals for the system. For example, we could try going organic because that maintains soil fertility better. Or we can go no-till because then we're not, you know, switch to a no-till system of gardening like sheet mulching. Because in that system, we have to worry about fertility a whole lot less. We can switch from uh, having monocultures and start using smart systems like guilds that use nitrogen fixers to fertilize the soil instead of having to use that. We can replace compost even with a whole system of fertility in the garden that uses natural nutrient flows, the natural fertility generation of, uh, of biodiversity and nitrogen fixers. And we can use deep mulch because research has shown Four inches of organic mulch a year can provide all the nutrients that a garden needs. Four inches of mulch a year of organic mulch, most organic mulches, will uh, provide the same amount of fertility as one inch of compost, which is the general recommendation in organic gardening. And at the same time, it's preventing weeds. It's reducing the amount of watering we have to do. It can stop pest cycles. So... Uh, it can keep the soil cool. So mulching is, and figure it, changing to a mulch type of garden is a system change that has all of these huge impacts so that we no longer have to do that brute force again. And finally, we can jump up to the most powerful leverage points, which are deep changes, changes to the whole paradigm about what we're doing and maybe even transcending those paradigms. For example, you don't farm anymore. You're not a farmer. You are here at, to, to farm for money, right? You're farming for happiness directly. Better yet, you're not a farmer at all. You're a beneficial species in your ecosystem. Maybe you're not even that. You're just a young relative learning to live in harmony with our elder relatives, the plants and the animals. This kind of perspective change can help us create systems that are much more beneficial to other species and maintain that soil fertility in a far better way so that we don't do the things that destroy soil and destroy soil fertility. So this is a, an example of how we can apply systems thinking to solve real world problems. And we can use this kind of thinking for almost anything we're talking about. If we're talking about losing weight, and we can talk about this more on maybe Tuesday and Thursday night, but if we're talking about losing weight, what's the first thing we always do? Get on the scale, or I should say, if we're talking about getting healthy, because maybe we don't even need to lose weight. We just want to improve our health. But what does we focus on? Weight, because it's a number. And we can step on the scale and measure it and try to make it go down. But this puts us in direct conflict with that piece of cake we want to eat, right? <laughs> so now we've set up our whole lives for conflict to change this number instead of changing our bigger ways of thinking about things. Does anyone have anything else to add to that concept? Other examples you want to bring in, ideas we can add to that? I'm going to give a little bit of space 
for people to think about that and maybe bring in some ideas. I'm gonna also add Becky's example today of making money because a lot of times, what do we do again? We think of our money problems and we immediately think of what's our income? What's our job? How much are we spending? Tracking the dollars and trying to change those when that puts us in conflict again with uh, in a lot of ways, instead of thinking about creating systems like Becky did, that will help her grow wealthy naturally over time. So we can use this thinking for anything, including for weeds. And this is the time here when I actually didn't do my homework. I didn't fill out this slide. So I have no idea what it's going to say. So we're going to have to fill it in together. <laughs> so when we're talking about uh, Danella Meadows leverage points for weeds, what would be some ideas of brute force methods we could use to deal with weeds? Pulling weeds and hoeing and stuff. Yep, the classic examples. Oh yeah, spraying them. Oh yeah. You know, and they're only just gonna come back. And think about that conflict. We have hardwired that conflict in to our whole food system so that we now are in a permanent arms race with the weeds. Weeds like amaranth are out, are winning against things like glyphosate so that they're no longer effective against the most important agricultural weeds. What are we going to do? We're going to make even more brutish poisons that are even more destructive and use those instead. Luckily, amaranth is indeed delicious, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Which we could consider a behavior change, right? Instead of spraying and pulling the weeds, one sort of behavior change would be eating the weeds. Are there other kinds of behavior changes we could, be, we could use for weeding? <laughs> Can we vote out the weeds? <laughs> Someone posted cover crops. Yeah, absolutely. Cover crop, in fact, cover crops might even be a kind of system change because now we're changing from a traditional conventional system where we keep, or we till and then have bare soil. And that's the whole system we tend to think of. Now we're changing to a whole new system where we don't keep the bare soil. We plant cover crops instead and keep that soil covered. So that's kind of, a behavior change and moving up to a system, systems change, this we could see we're getting even more powerful as a leverage point. Other behavior changes? You know, it's interesting. What you'll see is that when we focus on brute force, we are usually focused in on one specific thing. We do one kind of work. We spend the work weeding pulling out the weeds, that does one thing, it decreases the number of weeds we have. As we move up the leverage points, we get more and more holistic. So that uh, Noah's example of having a milpa garden um, where we maybe grow three sisters and have uh, plants do the, the work for us, we're now doing something that will have effect on many different aspects. It's gonna have an effect on fertility. So the three sisters type of garden is such a great example we can talk about. For people who don't know about it, I'll take a second to explain it. It's when we grow corn, beans, and squash together, instead of just growing a big field of corn. So that the, uh, the beans can climb up the corn so they have a trellis, already naturally. So the corn provides a trellis for the beans. The beans help fertilize the corn. And the squash running around can shade out a lot of the weeds so that we have fewer weeds too. So now we're talking about changing to a whole different system of gardening. A three sisters garden is a system and that has an impact on the water because 
the shade of the squash helps conserve water. It defeats pests because the squash, the uh, squash have uh, really rough, thorny vines, and they can tend to repel a lot of pests like deer and even raccoons. There's some anecdotal evidence that they repel raccoons. So we're changing a system and it has impacts on fertility, weeding, pests, watering, all of those things. So as we move up in our leverage points, we get more and more holistic ways of thinking about things. I see a few other great examples in the chat here. Um, chop and drop is a great change to behavior where now instead of pulling out the weed and it's going to come back, we're using the weed to fertilize the plants that we want to grow. So we chop the weed and drop it next to a plant that we want to fertilize. As the weed comes back, we chop it again. Over time, our target plant, the plant we're trying to tend, will outcompete the weed plant, and we will have used the energy of the weed to actually help and nurture uh, the, the plant that we're trying to grow. So we can often call chop and drop plants nurse plants because they've actually nursed the goal plant as, it's, as we've chop and dropped it. So we're using the weeds instead of being in conflict with them. Fortress plants, Noah mentions. Now we're, we're, we're really getting up to some strong points. Fortress plants, is another great system that I use in all of my gardens. These are plants that can actually use their, uh, their natural evolved uh, defenses against weeds. So we, we have plants, for example, whenever you look at a forest edge, you see plants that have evolved to outcompete grasses, which is why often you'll see the grassland go up to the forest edge and then stop. And if you look over that edge, the grasses really recede past that. If we were smart, we would use that same kind of natural design to protect our gardens and to do our weeding for us. So yeah, those are all amazing ideas as we're getting up to very deep sorts of changes. We're changing our whole paradigm. The weeds aren't always necessarily something that gets in our way to be defeated. In some cases, not all, in some cases, we can use those weeds as our friends. We can even choose plants that would traditionally be called weedy, like mints. And we can use those weed, weeds to help create amazing gardens that are great for wildlife and help our needs too. So now we're talking about really transformative changes to the way we think about weeding. And we can apply this kind of thinking all the time. In fact, sometimes I do this exercise. If I find myself in an area where I'm doing this kind of weeding, I'm getting out there and the garden is overrun, so I'm out there weeding with my bare hands, I think of exactly this kind of graph. And I think, right now, I'm doing this. Maybe I need to do this right now. But how am I going to move this particular area of the garden up in a stronger leverage points so that I'm weeding with my mind and not with my bare hands. Does anyone else, else, else have anything to add to this? I'm going to shut up for a minute and see if people have some more ideas. I think that was great as a brainstorm. I think we did a great job of that. Yes, close planting, again, is a great system change. If we can plant densely, there's not enough room for the weeds to grow. I'll throw this out there, um, and it's not necessarily easy. And I, um, I'm certainly haven't I haven't uh, employed this or or deployed this tactic. But I think in some cases, don't people bring in maybe a species that, well, let's just say would would help you do some of the pruning for the weed or for that uh, bush or for that trail hog. Um, I know here where I am, we've got, uh, we, we, <laughs> Janet and I look at each other, if not every day, every other day, how lucky are we? We have got stuff growing here. Um, we have got so much life. It's, it's, it's almost unfair, but that being the case, we don't always have the right balance. 
I can see some places I'm like, wow, that stuff's really grown there. I got to get the pruners out. I got to clip that because I kind of want to have a path to get back towards that peach tree and that low quad tree. You know, I kind of want to have a, a fairly easy path. But in general, I got stuff eating stuff and other stuff eating other stuff. So I'm wondering for those who aren't in quite the uh, rural environment that I am, that has quite a, that has this lucky enough to have this natural balance, would somebody bring in a certain species to, uh, to, uh, to help control uh, a weed population? So I just wanted to throw that out there because I, I've been kind of slacking today. I haven't, I haven't volunteered a whole lot, so I need to throw something out there. Uh, Are you I'm glad about you... goats? Sure, why not? Goats is a great one, absolutely. Uh, another one could be chickens. The, cla the classic idea of the victory garden and chicken tractors. Um, you know, the way uh, the, the chicken tractor idea classically works is you have, this is your normal garden, right? Your, your, your typical garden. And uh, instead of weeding the whole thing, you divide it in half and you put, um, uh, you put, that is a chicken, people. You put chickens in one part. That's a giant chicken. That's actually a big bird. Um, so that's a, a chicken there. And you put chickens in one side. And then you put the garden. These are, uh, it's a bad garden, the row crops, but everyone recognizes that. Uh, so this is, you put your garden in the other side. And uh, then the then at the end of the year, next year, you switch them. So the chickens go in, they can, over the course of a year, eat all the weeds, uh, fertilize it, eat all a lot of the pests, interrupt pest life cycles, um, and then you switch them again. So the chickens help fertilize the garden, they help do the weeding, they help do uh, pest management, uh, and hopefully at the end of the year, you've got a bunch of, of, uh, of uh, deep litter built up for those chickens as well. And uh, so you even have a mulch garden to begin with. So this is a classic thing and it changes the whole system so that maybe you're doing less weeding. For people who want to have a, a big kind of uh, a vegetable garden, especially a production type garden, this is a great system. Uh, and I've seen people set it up even in very small yards and it's just a system that, that, uh, that I really love. Let's check it in on the chat. Um, yeah, uh, goats can do the same thing on bigger areas. <laughs> uh, Chick Fil A, yeah, we, you know, I wouldn't mind honestly if Chick Fil A was closed all the time, considering recent their their political activities and the kinds of chicken that they buy and support. Uh, Noah mentions that that we can feed weeds to rabbit uh, and then feed the rabbit and poop to worm compost systems or to the gardens. You can, yeah, uh, you can do um, rabbit tractoring and rabbit systems um, for this kind of weeding too, for, for the classic victory guard. It's really a, a pretty darn good system for people who want to have wildlife or want to have livestock. Um, on broader places, people will make mobile uh, I'm sure this is pretty famous. We prob probably everybody on this call knows this. Make mobile uh, fences and move goats and move chickens to do uh, to, to prop garden areas and do some weeding for us. So another big system change for how we're doing weeding. Thanks, Dennis, for bringing it up. Um, and Noah mentioned, ooh, I'm scribbling all over the screen. Uh, Noah mentioned another big thing, which is permaculture zones. And uh, Bill Molson has a, implied in a couple places that permaculture zones might be permaculture's single most powerful tool. And yet I think it's underrepresented a lot uh, in the permaculture community sometimes. Because uh, by the way, does anyone just so I'm not talking the whole time. Does anyone want to chip in and 
give us an explanation for what a permaculture zone system is? So my understanding is that the lower zone numbers like zone one and two are things that are closer to where you live your daily life. Um, and those are things that are, require really high levels of management and more like intensive interaction. And then as you move out um, to zones three, four, and five, you have things that require less of that management or in some cases like zone five, basically no management at all. Yeah, thank you, Erin. That was a, a great description. And, uh, and uh, I think that um, a lot of people, uh, it, it's pretty concise, it's pretty clear. And so I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people undervalue it, because it's just so simple in a lot of ways. People don't necessarily understand how powerful it is, but it's actually our number one tool for weeding, it's our number one tool for pest management. It's our number one tool for maintaining soil fertility. It's our number one tool for reducing our overall labor in the garden. If you're operating a, a farm and you have paid labor, it's your number one tool for reducing your labor costs. And it's our number one tool for watering. And yet it tends to not be appreciated quite enough. I, I visited uh, around about a decade now ago, uh, one of our kind of famous North American permaculture farms. And, um, and the farmer in particular is, has been very uh, famous for being critical of the zone system. He didn't use the zone system in his landscape. A, a lot of the, some of the big permaculture farms have not used it, I think because they're underrepresented. Here. And I remember him talking about his day and he was saying, uh, you know, uh, first thing in the morning, I get up and uh, I hop on my quad because I got to go way out to where the animals were. And he had the animals in an animal tractor and it took a, he's got a big property. To, so it took him a long time to get there on the quad. And he said, well, while I'm out there, I got, I grabbed some uh, eggs for my breakfast. I bring the eggs back. He makes his breakfast. Then he's got to hop on the quad to go out to where the vegetable garden was at. It was in a completely different spot. And he's, you know, while I was there, he had a, a, like a mile of irrigation hose all over the place. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Fuel costs, right? He had a mile of irrigation hose and it had sprung a leak in right up by the house. And so he's going back and forth all day between the gardens and the animals with the water leak by the house. So all around the house had basically become a permaculture moat. We had a big moat there uh, that he had to go through the whole time. So it was a big muddy mess. And uh, then when, when he was out there, he had placed all of his vegetables in one place in a big garden and the irrigation system broke and they were having a drought. Guess what happened to all the vegetables in the vegetable farm? All the vegetables basically uh, were, were, were dying. And there was no protection out there for, from weeds. There was no protection from pests. So uh, the, the vegetable farm was really, really low uh, productivity. You know, it was basically becoming just a few things left. And I talked to his, uh, his workers, uh, the people who were working there, and they had the same sort of day. They'd spend all day on the, uh, only they didn't have a quad. So all day long, they were walking from the animals to the vegetable garden, to the house, to the animals, to the vegetables, and back to the animals, and then to the vegetables. And they said they probably spent about 50% of their day walking around this big farm. So 50% of his labor costs went to pay people to walk. So, uh, yeah, that's a great, a great, and, and yeah, so, and so it's the fuel too. So this one idea of implementing zones there, something that he had neglected, that he just didn't see the true value of, could have had a huge impact on his watering system, his irrigation costs, on his labor costs, the amount of time he was spending, and on his yields and on fertility systems, all these things by thinking more about zones. So let's switch that around and think about weeds for a second. He could have started out, by the way, what you're looking at now is the zone map design for when I was moving in 
uh, to to my last project site, Lily Cow. So this was done before. So I don't see any of our plants there yet. It was just uh, it was pre you know pre designed. So um, and what you see is the very front yard to the right and closest to the house is light pink, and that was zone one areas. So all of the crops, when we think about weeding, all of the crops that required the most protection from weeds, what are these sorts of things? Things that weeds will absolutely eat up are those lettuces you grow, radishes. If you've got weeds in a radish garden, they're going to bolt. Peas uh, perform very poorly under weeds. All of those things that require protection from weeds go right up there in that zone one garden. And because now we're thinking holistically, where those same plants tend to be the same plants that are the most vulnerable to water stress and require the most fertility management and have the most pest problems because they've been highly cultivated to be good food. They're, very, they're not wild at all. They have very few of their natural defenses left. We take all of those and put them into a small area. Now, this has been humanity's number one approach to weeding and watering and fertility and pests for just about as long as there's been humanity. In our last class, we were talking about that permaculture, uh, uh, the, the homestead pattern of humanity, the small holding pattern of humanity. You can look at European art. Last time we looked at some uh, European art, we looked at examples of home gardens in Nepal. They always have that one intensive area close to the house so that you see it really easily for weeds and because pests don't want to go there. They want to get as close to a stinky, smelly, mean humans as they have to. So they want to stay as far away as they can. If we take those plants and put them up in a small area close to the house, it provides a huge deterrent to, those, to, to wildlife. Now, small brute force things like a little light weeding and maybe a little bit of pepper and garlic spray can be extremely effective against pests. Then as we move out to zone three and zone two, we can start to use plants that don't require that kind of weeding and watering and protection. Things that are a little wild. So there's that milpa garden that Noah mentioned. Uh, I, I'm th I think about um, uh, uh, the book, um, um, uh, the Hidatsa Garden, um, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. And she describes a system of gardening where they had community type farm systems together as a community where they were all working and chipping in to do their milpa gardens with their three sisters. And they each had their own, their own little gardens. You, she described hers as being right up by her house again so that it was easily protected Smart societies have always used this kind of system. We're just the dopes who've forgotten it and need to reinvent it. Then as we, so as we move out further, you know, you can drive up and down any expressway in North America and you'll see tons of asparagus growing wild, right? You can grow asparagus out in the wildlands. It can defend itself from wildlife. It can de defend itself from weeds, apparently. It does just fine. Put that asparagus out in those broader acres where you don't need to defend it so much. So then you don't have to weed it anymore. You don't have to do those things. Now, so if we look at this and look at our landscape and we think only 10% has to be managed closely for weeding. We just reduced our weeding work by 90%. 90% of the landscape, we have decided we no longer have to weed. That's a paradigm change, right? Um, just to, here's another little illustration of what that kind of zone system can look like. And we'll go into more detail on this and talk and give specific examples about how we can use it uh, with plant lists and things for wildlife and for weeds and watering. We'll get more specific about this on Tuesday and Thursday night as we get into some of permaculture's other most powerful tools. But you see in this illustration from the book Beauty and Abundance, which, you know, I, I just always have to call out that, that, that marvelous book. <laughs> uh, you see something like this where you have a small, oh, thank you, Sandy. Yes, there it is. 
<laughs> as we call, as we look at this, we see a small protected area close to the house for zone one with an edible hedgerow around it where we can keep pests and wildlife out. We can do deep mulch gardening in there. We can do sheet mulching so we don't have to protect the garden so much from weeds. It's done. We've got a lot of our, our weeding work done for us. As we move out from there, we see food forests and what we'll call slash mulch gardens and milpa gardens, things that we'll talk about later that really radically require a lot less weeding. And we can use the plants out there to help uh, do the weeding work for us. To give you an idea, specifically with weeding in mind, for how we can do plants for a zone system. Uh, this is also from, from that great book. Um, and it shows some of the types of plants that we might plant in each zone. So in zone one, those things re require regular care, as Aaron was saying, observation and watering. These could be leafy salad greens and lettuces, leafy greens, herbs that we use every day like basil, cabbage family plants, including broccoli and kale. Critters love to eat those. Uh, weeds love to kill them. Uh, modern apple varieties are really hard to grow without some protection. A lot of things like peaches and plums and cherries. Uh, maybe peppers and other high value veggies. We can take all those, put them into a small area where we can really keep them protected. Boom. Now we can focus in all of our intensive weeding, watering, and pest work in one small area. That's so much easier than trying to manage the whole landscape that way. I will never go back to doing a garden that way again. Um, and as we go on from there, zone two might be those hedgerows. It might be a lot of our conventional fruits and berries that don't require so much work. Um, most of our, uh, a lot of our conventional vegetables and herbs, uh, things that don't require so much work again, we can do a little more wild. Maybe we'll have some livestock in this area, like those chicken systems we were talking about. Smaller animals that don't necessarily smell bad, <laughs> where we can check on them. They're close enough to the house. We can see them all the time. But they're not going to be waking us up at night and smelling bad, things like that. As we move out further to broader landscapes, now we're talking about systems that uh, require observation maybe once a week or visits once a week. Um, these could be dry farm vegetables. This is a lot of where I think of my zone three garden. By the way, you can see my zone system kind of sitting here from here. You can see my zone one garden um, right here today, a small area of sheet mulched garden beds with a living ground cover, a lot of intentional herbs, things that I want to eat every day. Zones are also the most important thing we can do for our health because eating greens every day, doctors will say that eating greens, daily greens is one of the best things we can do for our health. Putting those daily greens right up by the house is not only good for them, it's good for us. As I move out further, you can see my zone three garden out there. It's a lot wilder. It's things that don't require watering, that don't require much weeding that don't require as much pest prevention. And there I'm using systems for those instead of brute force. Finally, like Aaron said, we go out to zone four, zone five. Now we're really trying to get plants and animals to do that work for us. I'm planting what I might call uh, uh, um, uh, uh, guilds, I might call them terminator guilds, to take care of all the weeds for me, to spread on their own, to convert the gar to the landscape into garden without me even having to grab a shovel to do it. Figuring out the plants I can grow that will transform those parts in the landscape without me doing a thing. A lot of those are things like mints we talked about or asparagus, a lot of people call weeds. Now we have completely changed our whole paradigm on weeds by using the zone system. And I really do think it's one of the most powerful things we can do. And it's the thing 
that I would say has most changed my gardening so that now I have gardens that I can maintain in a few hours of work per week. And that's it. So I just like to reiterate again, uh, and by talking about this thing, sort of thing, I hope what we're doing is giving you ideas for your own zone design and how you can reconfigure the garden where you can figure out how to get nature and plants to do the work and animals to do the work out further and just be responsible for a smaller area ourselves. This also becomes our map for our better relationship with nature. Because now we're only, before we might think of our whole property as mine, you know, this is my space and try to control it. But now we're just taking maybe 10%, that zone one or less and keeping that in an intensively managed system. Everything else out from there becomes more of a matter of cooperation with nature with more space for all that life that Dennis Hamilton was talking about, right? Then we can have our own needs met and there's space for nature in it too. As we blow this up, last idea for today, as we blow this up for a whole world, this becomes our blueprint for a much more just and sustainable food system where we can do the same thing and pull all of these crops that require a lot of energy and maintenance and human hands into the places where people live. That will free up the work uh, of rural areas and larger farms to do the things that they can do best, which is cooperate with livestock and animal systems and with nature. This same zone system becomes our blueprint for a just and sustainable food system as well. I like to say this is a version of this that we created in my Transformative Adventures PDC a few years ago as a group. It's not really my own work. I can't claim it. But I would like to point out that this group in England, uh, I think they call their organization Food Zones, came up with almost the exact same thing because smart is smart. Once you think about these kinds of design solutions to things, these kinds of systems become, uh, become uh, uh, just apparent wherever you're at. And this group has created an amazing organization that has utilized permaculture zone thinking to re-envision their local food system and to make it, uh, to actually do that work. So they're actually enacting local food policy based on food zones. It's super inspiring work. You know, with this uh, permaculture church idea, hopefully every class, I'm gonna try to show you some inspiring things that's happening, that are happening in the permaculture world. Talk about some things that are practical, that'll help feed the body and uh, it's the name of the food. The group is uh, called food. I think they, it's called food zones. I think they, they, it's what they've used for the name of their group. I could be wrong about that. If someone can correct me, please do. Um, but I think that's, it might be on here uh, on their graphic. I don't see it on this graphic. I think it is called uh, uh, food zones. Um, so yeah, something to inspire you from the world of permaculture. Um, something to help you feed yourself and the rest of the world and something to feed your heart, your intellect and, um, and our culture as well. We could say our spirit as well. I hope you got a little bit of something of each of those today from chatting together. And I want to see if anyone else has any other last ideas to add to that. Remember, we've got classes on this Tuesday and Thursday night. Please check them out. I've got some different options to make them accessible to people. Uh, they'll be recorded as well and available in recording for those who are interested. And I have recordings of previous versions of this class because uh, we, they're always a little bit different. So you can get those and go even more in depth as well. If you, if you signed up for the class, I see Aaron nodding. If you signed up for the class, you'll get those as well. Make sure you remind me to make sure you get them. I have some questions. Oh yeah, and I see Veritas asked one too, um, uh, which is what's the take and teach package? 
uh, I have additional uh, materials uh, for people who want to take all my slideshows, take all my materials. You can get all of my materials, and I am really, um, I really want to build a permaculture activist network. So any of my materials, I encourage you to take them and go and give give uh, presentations to your own community. I am so thrilled to be able to say that people are literally doing this. Every, every season here, I've got people giving uh, talks at their local libraries, doing their own PDCs, uh, doing uh, permaculture programs, doing the landscape transformation program, using my materials. Nothing makes me happier. Um, so uh, I think we've got great materials too. So that's what that's about. If you would like to, to get the materials and get package a package to support you as a teacher a little bit more, um, that's what those take, take and teach packages are. Okay, yeah. so this PDC you're doing, can you explain a little bit more about how that works? Because I am just not very clear on that. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it hasn't been something that I've necessarily made very clear yet because it's been something a little bit uh, that is um, has been evolving because I've been talking with some of the other teachers I want to, uh, to include. I'm really trying to bring in as many people as I can. And um, so what we have are now two years of really great transformative adventures, um, uh, transformative adventures permaculture design certificate courses in total. Um, so what this is going to allow us to do is offer a complete sort of hybrid pre-recorded and live PDC. I'm never going to do a pre-recorded PDC. I just think that um, the Part of the whole point is community organizing and it's us interacting together and strategizing together and all of that. And it's about the interaction. Um, but what we do have now are those complete pre-recorded PDCs. And I was, I've rewatched them now and I think they're pretty good. I think they're, as someone who's taken a couple of pre-recorded PDCs, I'm really proud of this, of this content. I think it's, you know, I made it, so take it with a grain of salt. But I think they're the best content out there on, the, on this curriculum. It follows the classic uh, curriculum, but it's, it's got just a lot uh, of, of great details uh, and discussions. Um, so that allows me to do some additional things as live events. So uh, this fall, we're going to be doing a whole much larger expanded uh, permaculture for right livelihood. Uh, course. So instead of doing a complete another PDC, which I've done a few of now and recording them, I'm going to add that as optional content people can get. So if you take the current PDC, you will get all of the pre-recorded content and over the next forever, because anyone who takes my PDC, it's a PDC for life. If you take it, you can keep coming to the classes forever. Um, so continuing education and community organizing are important. So if you take the PDC, you get all the pre-recorded stuff and you get to attend all of the upcoming cool things that we're going to be doing, uh, like the, the uh, Right Livelihood program and a more in-depth local leadership program uh, are, are the kind of things that we have planned. Um, so as we create those new classes, you can, you'll be able to attend those as your PDC and pick and choose the things that are really interesting to you. And once you've finished all those, you will need to do a design project for me and give a presentation on that, if you would, please. <laughs> and then you get your, you, you get your PDC. Now, uh, so that's, that's how it works. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's a hybrid between a do it at your own pace, do it online pre-recorded thing mm -hmm. and an actual live uh, uh, live online thing. And as we go, we're really going to try to get people like Dennis Hamilton, who've been really involved here to do local versions of these as, as well, uh, so that we're starting to really build a local aspect to this too, and get local activists paid to do that, because that's really where the permaculture is at. Okay, so basically, I can buy it in little chunks, or I can plunk down a whole pile of money at once. That's exactly it. But once you've paid that, uh, that complete fee, if you wanted to then at that point, say that you've watched everything and, uh, and, um, and do your design project, then I will be proud to be your certifying teacher. 
All right. <laughs> now, my next question, <laughs> inquiring minds want to know, have you found a name for the new place yet? <laughs> I have been no. obsessing over this. I don't know why. No, no, we need to, we'll, we'll need to chat about that more and figure it out. All right. Take all the time you need. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, that has been a lovely two hours. Yeah, the, the cat, cat farm. farm. Is <laughs> I like the cat farm. So uh, on that note, thank you all so much for joining me. I've been thinking about a little bit. I kind of talked myself forced. I've been thinking a little bit more about ta uh, culture creation and, um, and uh, maybe for the ends of these, I'll start uh, maybe together, uh, unless that's way too cheesy. We'll see. I don't know if we can do it together on Zoom anyway. But uh, the oldest song, uh, this is literally the oldest song. I think it's kind of, in a way, a permaculture song. So this is Euripides' epitaph. It's the oldest song that we have actually written down in our culture. As long as you live, live in love. Let nothing trouble you. Life is only too short. And time takes its toll. All right, everyone. On that note, thanks for joining me for Permaculture Church. No wild horses this time. Dennis, you'll have to sing that song. <laughs> and, okay, see uh, you guys on Tuesday. All right. Hope to see you all Tuesday. Bye. <laughs>